You guys can have a seat. And I always get emotional in those moments. And uh, I mean, to think about what is going to happen there, to think about this room having people from Fort Collins in it next year, um, uh, unbelievable in this. Some of you guys need to start looking up um, Fort Collins on the way home and to be able to figure out what is, what's up there and is God calling me to, um, to go to Colorado. There could be a lot worse places to go to. Um, it's been amazing. I, I think about what God has already done in this place through this moment. I've been thinking about last night as Colin shared um, just his incredible talk and, and really the story at the very end. I, I leaned over to my wife and, uh, and I said, oh my gosh, that, do you realize that, uh, that Kim and John are, are Colin's parents? And he, and he didn't tell us, and I was freaking out, and I was trying to figure out, how can I run up on the stage and say something? And then Colin comes back and drops the bomb that, you know, and I already knew all the information. I'm sitting there, I'm getting teary about something I already knew. I was like, what's wrong with me in this moment? But it was such an incredible picture of what God does when people say yes with open hands, with uh, blank checks. And, uh, and, and I thought about that, and as I was sitting back there, I remember uh, really a story from uh, from our first ResCon, and uh, I remember that there was just there was a donor who was looking to invest in our church planting, and we had just introduced, hey, this is what we want to do. We want to plant all these churches. We were desperate for money, and um, I, I remember talking to him back in the green room. So we were back um, before I was to go out to speak, and and I and I asked him, hey, would you want to invest? And he says, no. And, um, and it was, a, I mean, it's a hard moment right before you go out and say, hey, this is what we're going to do. The guy says, hey, I don't believe in this. Um, and so, um, and see, he says this, he says, I can't invest in you guys because you're sending out anyone. For instance, you're sending out your drummer to plant a church. And if you choose something, if you choose to, uh, like different guys to lead your churches, maybe I'll invest in you guys. Um, the drummer he's talking about it was Colin, the guy who did this keynote speech for our conference. And, and so we politely said, uh, you can keep your money. We'll keep sending the drummer. So, uh, yeah. So, Josiah, I guess you're next. Uh, so, um, so here's where we're at. Today, I get to help us understand where we're going as a church. And I'm, I've been praying about this moment. I'm excited about this moment. But we're looking ahead but before we look ahead, I think as we begin to set the future and the tone of like what direction as we get together to collaboratively do this together, I want us to be able to understand where we've been and really what God has done. And so uh, really quick, I want you to cheer if you are from Salt Lake, Reno, Seattle, Corvallis, or Spokane. Would you just give a quick cheer? Awesome. All right. If you're from Bozeman, Missoula, Bellingham, would you cheer now? Boise and Pocatello, go. Monmouth, Cheney, go. Ellensburg, Moscow, go. And last place for from Pullman, go. Okay, here's what's fascinating about this whole thing. I don't know if you, you know, it was an audible thing here. Um, because back in 2017, when we talked about this, in that moment, ResCon won. 80% of the people that were at that, at that conference were from a singular town. They were from Pullman, Washington. Last night, I looked at kind of our whole roster, our registration, and what I realized is that now here in 2022, 80.3% of you are from some place outside of Pullman. I want you to get this, this reality. Yeah, there's something that has happened here. And yesterday, one of the most significant moments was seeing the number of you guys who have discovered Jesus since the last time we were together. Literally, eternities changed in this. And this is our story. It's the story of the church and ultimately the story of eternities changed over and over. And there's a moment that I think about when I think about the idea that we didn't just start in one place. And this whole idea idea of what we are together has gotten turned over from 80% being from one location to 80% being from all over. And this is this reality that I think about 
on the other side of this life, when we are in the face of Jesus, on the other side of eternity, when we are there, what would it be for us to discover how we arrived in the presence of Jesus? As we're in heaven, what would it be like to be able to say, how did you get here? And that's the question, how did you get here? And and, and maybe in that moment, we will have will be overwhelmed by Jesus' presence, and it, and it won't matter in this moment. But right now, I think about what it looks like for people to get into these moments in the presence of Jesus. It's the stories of Kim and John, and it's been our goal to be able to figure out how we get people into that moment. And those moments, when we begin to figure out how you got into the presence of Jesus, man, way bigger, way better than even these moments that we get to share. And what we've seen is over and over, this is what God has done with people through open hands and blank checks with their lives. This is what it looks like for hundreds that have reached thousands And this is the story of people that said, you need to hear of a God who gave what is most precious to him to demonstrate his love that while you were far away, he made a way for you to be connected to him through all eternity. And so this is what we started in 2007 when a few people gathered together and saw a legitimate pathway to change the world through the college campus. We saw the college campus And our hearts were broken for the college campus, but our imaginations were inspired. And so we had this goal, this thought of what it looked like for us to have an urgent, multiplying, collegiate church planting movement. And and over the last last years, we've seen some significant things. We've gone from, from one church to 15 churches. We've seen over 1,300 people decide to follow Jesus in baptism. We've seen 16,000 students be a part of community in our villages. It's incredible to see the scope of people that said yes to this. We saw God move. And the thing that I'm most proud of as we look in our past is that many of you guys did the most unselfish thing. You gave up what was comfortable for people you didn't know. You moved from friends to strangers to make them into family. Not because it was the easy thing to do, but because it was the thing that pushed us to cling to Jesus, to create a community that was radically different. And the hope was to take something that was deeply biblical, but culturally crazy and make it into something that became normal. And so we see these people on stage And that's just what we do. And it's a moment that we get to share and we get to say, this is who we are. We're people that go. The Great Commission doesn't start with the word build or protect or stabilize. That's what God does. Our response is go. And so I want to see what God has done over the last years, since 2007, as we set our sights and said, this is something we get to celebrate And this is the work of God. This is not the work of any of us. God has done this. And you have responded, many of you, in places of obedience to be able to make this happen. A room is filled of people whose yeses were on the table and ultimately has changed lives. But I want us to look forward to the future because I believe that God is doing something that is profound in us, and I don't want you to miss it. God saw fit to take our church, like many, through these difficult times and challenge everything in us in order to reshape and forge us into who we are to become and the future that he's called us to. And we can look back and say, of course, this is the God who would refine us. This is the God who would prepare us for what is next. A loving God would not let us remain untransformed. And so we have seen God take us through the last two years to be able to set our sights on what he has for us in our future. And this is what God does in us. And this is what God does to keep his church moving forward. He takes us through the difficult times and allows us to rediscover our spiritual power in him alone. And so as we do this, I want us to see this moment. And I talked about this at the very beginning, but I want to connect this into a few different moments so we can begin to see what God might be calling us to. So let me go all the way back Maybe not all the way back, but let me go back about 500 years to 1505. In 1505, there was a college student who was walking to class. Lightning struck next to this college student, and he freaked out. This college student said, help me, St. Anne, and I'll become a monk. He lived through it, and so then two weeks later, he dropped out of law school 
and he became a Benedictine monk. So he went from studying law to studying the scriptures. And as he studied scriptures, he began to recognize that what was said in the Bible and what was done in the church was radically different. And as he began to press into this, he began to say, this is Someone has to do something about this. Something have, has to reveal that the, what, is the, what the church is doing to consolidate all the power in this is radically different from the God of the Bible who created the church to be something radically different in the lives of those people. And so as he studied this, he came up with a group of things that he thought were radically wrong. And he took and wrote down these 95 things and he nailed them to the door of the Wittenberg Church, All Saints Church in Wittenberg. And in this, this is what we see is the beginning of the Reformation. And this beginning of the Reformation is something that transforms the church. It transforms everything about how people understand their theology and their connection with God. What happens in this is he transforms how people begin to go to God and transforms how the church works in the lives of people. No longer is this a place where the church is consolidated power. What happens is that Martin Luther begins to reveal a new way to have an understanding of God and releases this theology. Colin talked about that last night. So what he does is he, d- he does this. He begins to write this stuff down. He translates the Bible from Latin into German. And another guy, a guy named Johann Gutenberg, creates this invention called the printing press. And what happens is they begin to print the Bible. They begin to print the Bible in the language that people can read. And what happens is throughout that time, of all books were written in that time by Martin Luther, right? His translation of the Bible, his writings, and this gets distributed across Europe. What happens is that the church gets released and empowered and people begin to get theology that they can read and they can understand and they begin to get this and this releases something into the world. This releases something and empowers people that ultimately leads to to the enlightenment. So you see this moment, you see this person that seizes the moment, we see this invention, and this moment coalesces into something that we see and we call the great, or sorry, the Protestant Reformation, and this changes all of these things. It doesn't just change the church, it changes society that leads to massive, massive change, including the Enlightenment. So for the sake of Colin, I have a slide that helps us to understand this. See, this is, this is Martin Luther, right? He doesn't always nail things to the door, but when he does, stuff happens, right? So there you go, Colin. There's a meme for the day. So um, this, is, this is this moment, and it, transforms, um, and it transforms the church, and it transforms the world. But let's back up to that. Let's go all the way back to the first century. Let's look in the book of Acts. In Acts 6, I think there is a tiny illustration of something that is a massive moment. So if you have your copy of scripture, you can turn to Acts 6. We'll start in verse 1. This is a small thing. It's easy to overlook. It almost seems like an aside. There's all this stuff that's happening in Acts, and then all of a sudden, it's like this little thing that they begin to say, hey, and this thing happened too. But I want us to see that when it looks like the church being unleashed into the world to transform the world, this is one of the most important aspects of this. This is one of the most important moments in scripture. It says this, but as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. So what happens is we begin to see the Acts church. We begin to see the multiplication. There's people that are coming to Christ. There's transformation happening. There's people that are saying yes to Jesus. And and as they are multiplying, This thing naturally creates this tension. I want us to get, as we begin to say, yes, we're gonna go, we're gonna multiply, we're gonna see disciples that make disciples. All the way back to the first century, any discontent, any tension that we're gonna see is something that has happened in the church every single time because it stretches us. And so here's what we get to see. This is, there were rumblings of discontent. Um, It creates these difficult, multiplying presses hard, on all of us. Hearing the gospel 
is one of those things that as we begin to think about what the response of that is, it presses on our personal needs. The mission of God exposes the idols in our hearts. It exposes what is most important to us. It exposes our deepest motivations. I've seen this over and over as we've pressed hard. It exposes what is deep in us. It says this, The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers saying their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. All right, there's this sense of not being cared for, right? And so there's this tension of being able to say we have to care for people, and obviously the gospel is being expanded. And those two things are being held in tension. So verse 2, it says this. So the 12, these are Jesus' disciples, called a meeting of all the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And so brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. It says this in verse five, everyone liked this idea and they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas of Antioch, and earlier converts to the Jewish faith. And these seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on him. You might think in this that somehow this separates the important people from those who are unimportant. But I want you to get that mentioned in here is Stephen, who goes on to be the first martyr and And honestly, he gets more attention than some of the apostles. And his death likely starts a process that ultimately multiplies the church. And we'll get into that a little bit later. These are people who had a significant role to play. In verse seven, it says this. So God's message continued to spread. People were cared for and God's message continued to spread. The numbers of believers Believers greatly increased in Jerusalem so that many and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. Now, I want you to get this underlying thing. And I think this is why Luke included this because this is a profound moment when we begin to see that the movement of God, what does it look like for this to happen? It looks like us being able to say um, these things kind of coalesce, right? That, That this is crazy that there's these people And this understanding that they had in Judaism is that there's a strict divide between those who are priests and those who are not. And what is happening is this is getting brought together, that there is not a group of people who do ministry and a group of people that receive ministry, that in Christ, we are all part of the solution to this. We are the hands and feet of the body. And this is a fundamental change. And what we begin to see is the the speed of the church as it begins to move, create health and everywhere it goes, this is one of the key ideas that are behind this. Jesus says, I'm leaving, right? I'm empowering you. The disciples say, we are empowering you. This is what happens over and over. Martin Luther, what is happening? He's empowering people. I want you to get that over and over where there is health, where there is moments where we begin to see the body of Christ being able to move towards its place in restoring the world It always happens when there's people that are joining the game, when there's this empowerment that has happened. God's message continues to spread. Peace priests are becoming followers. It's the moment for the early church. And this is the moment we believe that we are in as Resonate as well. In the same way as as the Protestant Reformation brought this theology to people, we believe that we're in a moment where God is opening the door for the mission to be brought to people in an increasing way. We believe that there's a moment in our world right now that we see the decentralization of things. We see the, that the tribalization of things. We see this need more and more for that same moment to happen that it happened in the first century, that happened in the 14th century, and now needs to happen in the 21st century for us to be able to say, what does it look like for the church to have this moment where people are radically empowered out from our church? When this happens, it's crazy powerful. It transforms things. Let me give you an illustration. Back in 1939, 
um, there was something that happened. And, and, and as we lead to this, I want you to get that in September of 1939, Germany had invaded Poland and it was beginning its westward march across Europe. This, as the Germans marched west, westward, it mobilized the French and British forces who crossed the English Channel to be able to engage the German forces. The German forces continued to advance and push back those forces. And so by May of 1940, they had driven the British and French forces all the way back to the English Channel. And what happened there was 400,000 troops were trapped between the water and the German forces. You have the English Channel, you have the German forces, they were trapped there. And this represented, that 400,000 troops represented the most significant fighting force of the Allies at that time. The Supreme Allied Commander ordered the men to a harbor named Dunkirk because it had the largest, broadest beach that could accommodate all of these troops. But what happened is the German began bombing the harbor. They destroyed the water, the water supply so they couldn't fight the fires, and they began to destroy the piers with their bombs. And so what happened is all of these troops were at this harbor and the Germans destroyed effectively the way by which the warships were able to get to those soldiers to evacuate them. So the Royal Air Force began to engage these fighters, these German fighters, and began to drive them back just to give a little bit of an opportunity to be able to, um, to, to get this this group of people, this 400,000 soldiers off the beach. And so they proceeded to carry out Operation Dynamo to evacuate 400,000 soldiers across the English Channel. The problem was, because of the way that the piers were destroyed, they couldn't get their ships into the harbor to be able to offload the soldiers. As the German forces advanced, there were sitting ducks. There were just this group of soldiers out exposed on this beach. And they knew that the end was going to be near if something didn't happen. So they have all these soldiers. They can't get them off of the beach. They have these warships that can't get in to offload the soldiers, and it looked like a massive, massive catastrophe. So they changed the tactic. Instead of this being a military thing, it became an everyone thing. And across Britain, the call went out, if you have a boat, we need your boat. And so, Across the 39 miles of the mine-laden English Channel, individuals took their fishing boats, their pleasure boats, their lifeboats, their speedboats. They took them into battle to save lives. Over the course of the next four days, 933 boats rescued 338,000 soldiers. 933 boats. The majority of these boats weren't military boats. There were people who had a boat and can use it to do something that would change the course of the war. I think we have a picture of one of those boats. This is a picture of someone who's using their boat, and these guys are wading out and getting on someone's boat, and you can't see it probably, but I love the name of the boat, Vanity. A boat named Vanity takes and goes across the mine-laden English Channel to be able to pick up soldiers, and they do this time and time again. This is this picture. This is what happened in this, and we all know that in this, that um, as this happened, 
It changes the course of the war. You have this 400,000 students, instead of being prisoners of war, are people who could go on to fight. Winston Churchill called this the miracle of deliverance. And we know looking back now that this group of people would return to those beaches in the most significant assault in human history as we see a day that we now call D-Day. And D-Day was made possible by Dunkirk. And Dunkirk was made possible because there was a moment that they decided that the key wasn't a military strategy, but an invitation for everyone to join in the mission called Dynamo. And they didn't do this because the military says you have to do it. They did this because they were compelled. There was a huge need and they weren't okay to say, good luck, I'll just live my best life. And see, I want us to get the enemy wants to distract and, dist- and, and really distort God's purpose for our life. He wants to throw money and venture. He'll throw you compelling life plans and make you look just a little too busy for anything else. He'll throw you a lot of good things to keep you on the sidelines. He'll give you all kinds of reasons to keep your boat tied up to the dock. But I promise you, none of those things is worth the feeling of returning with a boat full of people who are rescued because of your decision. And so here's the broad thing that uh, that I want to introduce for us and lead us to in the next two years. We want to create our own Operation Dynamo, where everyone plays, and we're having the vision of a church where no one is on the sidelines and everyone has a role. We believe for the last 2,000 years this kind of church has transformed people and transformed places. It's been an unstoppable force. And I want us to get, how do we change the world? We understand that the engine of the college campus is, is really what we see that God uses in incredible ways. But we want to be able to recapture the movement spirit of the New Testament and to be able to say, how is un, God's unstoppable force? How does it change the world? 21 by 21 was really about us planting churches as an organization. But what's next really is this transition for us to be able to say, we want to move from what we do as an organization to be able to radically empower individuals. The last six years has been about us starting churches, but the process has become clearer to us. Through the journey, God has continued to lift up our eyes to be able to see what is next, to see something bigger. And we've realized that going from one church to 15 churches and beyond um, just isn't big enough. We've come to realize that the college campus is the beginning of a bigger story that God wants to write. And this is the beginning of a significant shift for us in the life of our church to take the focus off of us, to take the focus off the brand resonate and put the focus on you, the disciple maker. We want to decentralize and take really take the focus off of our brand and to be able to say, how is it that you get in the game, that you are mobilized? This is the shift. Check out this video as it explains a little bit more of what we believe in this. The college campus has long been the focus of our prayers. We've seen God move our friends from death to life. We've seen churches grow from living rooms to auditoriums. We keep praying and asking God to do more, to help us think bigger. We may be tempted to think bigger means larger groups, bigger buildings, bigger platforms. But what if thinking bigger means each one of us thinking bigger about our small spaces? We want to be the church that goes to the spaces that have yet to be saturated with the gospel. The campus has always been the target, but it's really a starting point, a launching pad for gospel saturation. Universities are packed with students who can be empowered and launched into every family and profession, every city and passion to bring good news and be the church on their college campuses, in their cities, in their neighborhoods, and across the world. Our vision will continue to lead us to the college campus, but the lanes that lead the college campus are infinite. 
Lanes that take all of us everywhere. Everywhere means everywhere. Everyone means you. You have a purpose to seize. You have something to surrender. You have a gift to be leveraged. You have a place to transform. You have people to influence. You have a decision to make. What will you do with your small space? I want you to get that language, that idea that we want to empower everyone to go everywhere to make everything more like heaven. This idea, the great thing that unites us, this idea that's, that it really is all of us, it really is everywhere. And we really believe that it means everything. That, that Jesus set upon our hearts to be able to say, hey, you are my hands and my feet. You are the tangible expression of what the gospel looks like. And it is your role to be able to, to, be, a, to be a participant in this wherever you're at. And over and over, we see from Acts for the great, to, to the um, Protestant Reformation, we see these moments where people are empowered and the, and the world changes and we think that we're on the cusp of this. And our goal is for you to experience the transformational grace of Jesus, for you to experience life-changing community, for you to experience world-changing purpose. And we want to have this happen for the rest of your life. That this just isn't a college thing. This is not just right here, right now. We want to see this family of disciples be more than just an experience you have in college. We want to see this flywheel spin faster and faster in your life as you form deeper and deeper relationships. That you don't stop being a people once you graduate. That we find Jesus and we find our purpose and we find our place and we find our career. And all of this coalesces into what God has us called to in the future. And so let me give you a, a, a few ways by which this looks. But we want to create some different lanes, and we want to really show you how you can be a part of this and participate in this. And, and so these, these, these lanes, uh, in fact, let me just give you a, a quick picture about these four different ideas that we have a part of what's happening on the collegiate side, the community side, the global side, and even we'll get into what it looks like with a thing called the Antioch Project that allows us to be able to mobilize towards micro churches. So let me go into this collegiate piece and to be able to help you to understand, we believe that the college campus is the most fertile ground for the gospel to have movement. We are not going to just help our existing churches grow in, in health. That's one of the things that we want to commit to. But not only that, we are going to continue going forward in this. We are going to continue to plant churches on and around university campuses. And there are, um, there are, are site pastors who have gotten together and said, hey, this is what we want to do in the next two years. And so I want to tell you, over the next two years, our site pastors are setting their sights on planting five new college churches. Five new college churches. In the next two years, uh, our vision is to be able to see there's places like you see Colorado State and four more places that are across the West that we want to send groups of people to, to be able to have new places. And there's some of you that in this, in this context, you uh, really, God might be calling you to say yes to this and say, I'll go. That someone came to my campus and because someone came to my campus, I want to be a part of going to some other campus and I'll go and I'll give the first part of the next season of my life to go and reaching college students. And some of you are like, man, I love being a college student. I want to stay a college student. And this is your opportunity to stay engaging in college students. You can go and just continue to be a part of that process. It's an incredible time. Don't make it in too soon, right? Going to other college campuses and planting new college churches is a part of what we're going to do. We're going to do that. And some of you need to put your yes on the table for that. But that's not all. In the next two years, there's another lane to this. And another lane is for us to be able to say we want to start not just planting stu uh, churches for college students, but to be able to go beyond that and plant college or plant churches 
for our communities. This is what we're going to do. Our site pastors had got together and said, hey, in the next two years, we want to plant two churches that are exclusively focused on our communities. It's a big deal. For some of you, God is calling you into the marketplace, into education, into business, into industry. And so instead of us saying so long, um, we want to help build on the story that you began in college. Many of the resonate values are the same, but it looks different when you're working a full-time job. And we want to create opportunities for you to enter as a young professional and be surrounded by people who are navigating that same stage of life. We want to continue to walk alongside you as you have a family, and we want to help you to be able to navigate that. You know, as you're losing your mind trying to (laughs) trying to navigate life as a family, we want to be there and help you to figure out what life looks like as a parent. We want to be able to create a community around you that makes disciples for the whole person for their entire life. And one of my one of my hopes and my desires is that we would have a broad group of business meeting of business people who are both a support and a resource to one another. A few years ago, I was at Redeemer Church in in New York City, and one of the things that kept college students around as they became young professionals was a thing called the Gotham Fellowship. It was a place where believers were connected together for support and to help each other in their careers. And I began to think about this as the vision for what our community churches could look like as we began to see multi-generational people being able to say, hey, here's what it looks like to succeed as, as you're a Christian in business. And so we desire to be able to engage over the next two years our young professionals and our families in a significant way. And these churches are going to look different than our college churches, but but let's let's face it, um, you're probably going to want them to look a little different in some ways too. So this is a good thing. So I want you to think about who you're doing life with. There might be a day when someone in your church tells your kids some of the stories about who you were in college. And I want to just press really quick and say, let me tell you why you should stay a part of a family, even as you, even as you graduate. Because as we move into different parts of our life, that transition is a fragile time sometimes for our faith. And when we begin to separate from our uh, people that we've done life with, man, it creates this moment. And we've seen over and over that the transition in college and the transition out of community creates this vacuum that many people, they wreck their faith in that moment. And so we want to say, keep the same group of people that you've been doing life with, but navigate to the next stage of your life. And we want to make that transition as seamless as possible. We want to empower churches in any context. And this means not just in massive auditoriums, but also in living rooms. We want to empower churches of all sizes. We want to empower everyone to go everyone, everywhere to take and make all kinds of different churches. And many of you have discovered Jesus in community. And I love hearing stories of our baptism services where people say, man, I found a group of people that are unlike any group of people that I ever got to connect with in my life before. I discovered people who followed Jesus and it changed my life. Transform people, transform places. And so here's what we want to do. We want for you to discover that what you discovered in college doesn't have to end when you graduate. We want to equip you to be the church wherever your next step is. We see a pattern in the New Testament where churches are started, and as churches are started, then they grow and leaders are appointed. We see Paul tell Titus that there's these churches that are started, and now they need to make sure there's leaders, but it doesn't mean that we don't start churches. And so what God is doing to really start moving and start churches is really radically expanding in this way. And it might be that a group of you begins to get together and your prayer is, what are we going to do next? And it might be that some of you begin to say, let's go to Denver together and start something. Let's go to Portland or let's go to another country and, and let's go to Texas. You know, and so, um, you know, all these different kind of contexts that you begin to say, hey, we've been doing this thing as a village, but we're all going to, we're seniors, we're, we're going to graduate but what does it look like for you to be able to say, let's stay together 
Let's go together. Let's move together. Let's go start something together. Let's, let's see if something that God could do to be able to expand this thing in a significant way. And over the next two years, we are going to help create pathways for you to start micro churches. Some of you have a heart for people who don't look like you, who don't live where you live and aren't from where you're from. It's our belief that go means go, everyone means everyone, and everywhere means everywhere. And so another part of our pathway for us is to say over the next two years, our vision is to plant a collegiate church in a global city. Our desire is to go to a place where people from all over the world are present. We believe that this could be an incredible opportunity for us not just to reach the global city, but have the opportunity to in, for that impact to be amplified across places that are incredibly difficult to get to. There's crazy stuff that's happening. We have seen God open up an incredible door and just work in incredible ways for us to be able to walk through an opportunity, the place, you wanna hear it? London, England. As we think about, as we think about um, e even the way that God has led crazy amounts of world leaders to have their education in that place, that God has gathered people to that place, that there's an accessibility to that place, our goal is in the next two years to plant a collegiate church in London, England. And for some of you, your next two years post-college might need to be in London, looking for where God is moving you as you interact with people across the world. There's more that we're focusing on. There's so many things that God is doing across our sites. And your site pastor is gonna say to you, hey, there's the vision specifically for our site to be engaged in this, but this is what we're doing together that we're planting collegiate churches, that we're planting community churches, that we're empowering people to take what God has given them and to start micro churches. And we're aiming at the nations in the next two years to start something that is outside of our country in England. And this is what we believe God has called us to. Remember when we talked about Stephen as one of those people that were empowered? One of the guys that stepped up one of the guys who said yes, one of the guys who claimed responsibility. Well, that started this opposition. We begin to see the Stephen, the first martyr. And that first martyr, part of the people that were there in that moment is a guy named Paul. And Paul accelerates the opposition, or Saul, and Saul uh, accelerates the opposition to the church. What it does is it drives people out of Jerusalem. Saul has a moment where he becomes Paul, where God intersects his life. But what happens is those people begin to leave as they take the gospel. They're empowered. They see what has happened in terms of how the church is to operate. And what we see is this incredible picture in Acts 11, just a few chapters later after chapter six in Acts. And we see that we are introduced to the church in Antioch. And this is why we call this the Antioch Project, right? Is what we see is that there's a church that is established, not by leaders of the church, but by people who are just regular people who go and take their faith with them. And as they take their faith with them, they simply decide to take the good news of Jesus and they start churches wherever they go. And what we see is something that is profound. We see that these people become so impactful that this is where they're first called Christians. This is where they're first called followers of Christ. And this is where this begins to make such an impact that they begin to say, hey, we've got to name these people because it's so clear that they are different and transformative to this area. And they, through this identify, and identification of being Christians, they begin to transform the world around them. They begin to flourish. And this happens so significantly that this church begins to then go back and support the church they came from in Jerusalem. This is the shift that happens time and time again when people get into the game. When people begin to say, I'll be a part of this. When people begin to recognize there's a role to play, there's something that we've all been invited into. There's a place for all of us to be a part. Behind the screen, you might have noticed that there's something that's been transformed by this, that there's this place for all these pixels beginning to be changed in this. And in this, I, I, I want us to get
that we look at this screen and we look at this place and we think about these, these moments where there's these spots that are blank. Just like Taylor says, there's a blank place. You can put your name on it, right? But this is what this is all about. You ever do something like, why did I just do that? But I want us to get that this is what we're called into. That you've been created. I, I love the slumdog millionaire thing, that there's something about your life that's unique. And there's so many of these spaces and there's so many of these opportunities for us to seize this and to be able to say, hey, this is what it looks like. Every pixel that gets transformed is a discovery of a believer getting into the game. And I really want for you to get this picture in your head. This is the vision of our church. And this may seem overwhelming, but the truth is it's just about you and one of the spaces. It's really about our choice for our small space, the people in the boat didn't have to figure out, how do I get 400,000 people off this shore? I just have to get a few in my boat. I just have to take responsibility for this. When I was a senior in college, um, a guy came to my college town named Louis Giglio, and he came to my town because a girl named April Lockhart invited him. Now, April Lockhart would marry Matthew Young, and uh, they would go on to start Resonate Moscow. But this was many years before of that. She invited a guy named Louis Giglo to come. And he began to tell us about the idea behind this, that our lives were aimed at something bigger than ourselves. And the only thing that I remember from that moment is he says this, if you have a light to shine, go shine it in a dark place. If you have a little light to shine, go shine it in a dark place. And it wrecked my life. It fundamentally changed my life. I was looking for my light to shine in the place where it was the lightest light, where my life would be filled with people that acted like me, that thought like me, that were surrounded by me in community. And the words of Louis pushed me to pray, God, where would you have me go? As I began to pray this, it brought me out of living in Texas to move to the Northwest because there was a dark place. There was a blank space that had my name on it. And I began to pray and say, God, will you use me? And so in 2000, Paige and I packed up all the stuff we owned and we moved up here. And this is what God called us to do, but I don't want you to get this because somehow you feel like an inspiring video. I want you to get convicted and compelled by Jesus himself. And I want us to look like, to, to, to see what this looks like as we fast forward in this. So Sam, go ahead. Let's see what this looks like. As we see these things multiply so we see the blank spaces filled. I know you're blinded by this, right? Let me tell you, I, I think this ultimately is a picture of heaven. It's a picture of what we get to aim at. This is a picture of ultimately what God's calling to. This is a picture at one point God's saying, hey, this is what I'm going to do in the world and I want to use you to be able to make this happen. So here's what I can promise you by saying yes to this. This won't be easy. But number two, you're gonna feel alive in this. The Holy Spirit is going to show up. And I want you to get, there's gonna be someone on the other side of your yes whose life is going to be changed forever. God never wastes our yes. So what might God be calling you to? What might it be as you look to the next two years of your life where you can be a part, putting your yes on the table, opening your, up, your hands to be able to say, God, take me, use me. And I promise you, he'll be faithful to this. Let me pray for you. God, 
Help us to see our blank space. Help us to understand how you have created an opportunity for us to experience your power, to be able to understand who we are, and to be able to be used to do something far bigger than ourselves. God, I pray that in this moment you would help us to see what you've created us for. Help us to get a vision that's bigger than any other vision. I guess it's in your holy name.